Talk. Hi. Welcome, everybody, to Knock Knock High with the Glockham Fleckens. I am Dr. Glockham Flecken. I am Lady Glockham Flecken. Will and Kristen Flannery. We are so happy to have you here. I, I am I'm very excited about this episode. It's so fun. Uh, we are talking to Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. Uh, this is a New York Times bestselling author, medical historian. Uh, uh, she has a PhD from the University of Oxford. Uh, she's got just one of my favorite books, The Butchering Art, which mm-hmm. uh, you've seen on our bookshelf for a while. I don't know if yes. you've read it. No, I have not. I um, I pushed. I was like, I reached out to her and was like, we have got to have you on this podcast because I love the book um, as a physician, but also just as like a someone who loves like yeah, I feel like you'd be up your alley kind of regardless thing. because you do kind of like the dark, gory yeah. type things. You like horror a lot. Not that it's horror, but you know, it's, it's yeah. a lot of details about nineteenth century uh, medical practices, yes. and I. As no, will surprise no one, I do not do well with details about medical things. So that's the one and only reason I haven't read it. But I would, I would kind of like to see like a redacted version with all the gore cut out <laughs> because she yeah. does write so well it, that I, I still want to read it. It's a uh, uh, such a fat and, and just medical history in general, like where we've come in the last like hundred, hundred and fifty yeah, years. It, it's it is fascinating and and scary. And remarkable. It just my takeaway was I'm glad to have been born in the era of anesthesia. Yes, I'm very thankful for that. Absolutely. Um, and it's you know you I I actually don't read a lot of books. Mm-hmm. I I I don't know because probably because I spend so much time on social media. And yeah, you're more of a watcher. You watch things. I, I do like TV, I do like watching things. Social media. I play video games too. Yeah. I I don't know. I I spend time when i probably should be like reading a book i think society tells you you should read more Mm -hmm. um people say that that's a thing people say it's a thing they say i don't know how many of them Uh, are doing it like so so dr fitzharris she is just one of the people that like i'll one of the very few authors i'll just like go out and like buy that book because Drop everything. I'm, I'm like describing someone just liking an author like it's a new thing. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I like, just really like her writing. Like we did for the Harry Potter books when we were kids. That's that's her for you as an adult. It is, exactly. Yeah. And uh, you um, you read more than me. Yeah, I do. I like to read. Um, you like to buy books. I have a book buying problem. <laughs> if that, that yeah, mm-hmm. that's my one main shopping vice, which it could be worse. I mean, I like shopping of any kind. Don't get me wrong, but books will really get me because okay. they're like you know twenty bucks a pop or something. So it like feels like a smaller purchase, but then I end up buying can you seven of them in one sitting? Can you explain something to me? What? How if you're buying so many books, why do I always hear you listening to audiobooks? Well, <clears throat> <laughs> can you? It's because can you, ex- can you explain? I, I'm just trying to figure this out. Yeah, my preferred method is to read a book. <clears throat> However, the realities of modern life don't leave me a lot of time to just sit around and look at something. You seem to find plenty of time to do that. However, I love someone around. has to keep I, things I love, moving. I love sitting on the couch. Yeah. I turn my brain off. I, I'm really good at turning my brain off. Well, if I end up sitting and reading, then I usually will fall asleep is what will happen because mm. I'm always right on the verge. So... I get the audiobook because I can do that while I'm doing other things, you know, while I'm going about my day, doing the chores or getting ready and you know, putting my makeup on in the morning. I listen to things a lot. So, yeah, so I'll end up buying like the paperback or hardback version of a book cuz I like a good physical book. But then I never get time, but the, I still really want to read it. So then I I will buy the um so you get a little... audiobook version. Yeah. And sometimes then I'll go, yeah, I have the physical book to reference, right? Like if I, where was that thing? Or if I want to share it with somebody, then I can do that. Sometimes you'll love this. Sometimes I also have the Kindle version. And then sometimes there's like a, a bundle option you can do where if you buy the Kindle version and the audio book, what is, what is our then it book will budget sink right now. Shush, 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 shush. It will <laughs> sink across the two so that like if you're, if you are on one page in one of them, it'll, you can pick it up on the other. So you can, Alternate back and forth between reading and listening. Is this the reason we haven't finished paying off my loans yet? No. Is it? 
No. Okay. I think that's because more of your things <laughs> than mine. You mean just the cost of my if, education? Yeah. If books are, you know, my one vice, that's not doing too bad. Yeah, that's fine. There uh, are worse things. There, there are worse It's not like, vices. you know... <laughs> Designer handbags or something. So you get Although a, those are an investment. You get a little. Too. You get a little dopamine hit. You get a little. I do. Little There's just something about a Barnes and Noble book. with a And I like book. to. I like to just. I have. I like to have books. I like to hold them. I like to decorate with them. I like the smell of books. I like the smell. Yes, the feel of the paper when you turn the pages. Okay. I just like books. I'm so sorry. We're, so we're we're gonna be talking about books because Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris has written a couple of really good ones. Uh, yes. And also a children's book coming out too. Yes. And she just was super fun to talk to. Yes. She's a hoot. Absolutely. I feel like she's the one at a party that you want to, you know, be nearby because she's got all the best stories. And she's she's been everywhere too. She's a, an award-winning author too. She's won the Wilson Award for Literary Science. Uh, her books have been translated into 20 languages. Uh, her latest book, The Face Maker, which uh, was out on a hard copy, hard, hardback, hard copy, hard copy. Is that you don't called? even know hardback? how to talk about a hardback a book. book uh, was uh, uh, published last year, and the um, the paperback version is coming out soon. And I think it'll be out by the time by the time this you hear this airs. It's probably it's out. out. Go, go get, get it. it. Go, yeah, go get she it. She also sure. writes for a lot of publications too: the Wall Street Journal, Scientific mm-hmm. American, the Guardian. Just basically, if you've ever heard of it, she's probably written for. She's it. had a television series, uh, yes. the Smithsonian Channel. And um, uh, just she's been all over the place. Yeah, and her, she's got her, some YouTube, uh, yeah, fun you, YouTube videos. We as talked well. about that as well. And yes. So uh, uh, just a really fun conversation. I hope you enjoy it. So let's get to it. Here is Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. All right, we are here with Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris, uh, a best-selling New York Times best-selling author and uh, my favorite medical historian. Is is oh? Can I tell you that uh, you are? You. I, there's not you many might of us the, out there, though. <laughs> yeah, you might be the only one I know, but you are absolutely my favorite. Um, I gotta, I gotta say, uh, you know, I first learned about you on Twitter, and uh, uh, this was several years ago, shortly after your first book was published. And just to let everyone know, like social media uh, promotion works because I was, <laughs> I, I started seeing your tweets, and you were like giving all kinds of these little like uh, vignettes and snippets about, I don't know, like grave robbing and like, uh, like <laughs> for, for medical, you know, studies or I don't know, just, just random things like that. Yeah. And I was like, I got to check out this book. And so uh, um, I'm glad that I ran across you on social media because it really is fun to, to hear your perspective on things. And he did get the book audience. and he read it. Yeah, it works. <laughs> That is amazing. Yeah. I mean, I feel like whenever a new book comes out, I'm just a broken record. I'm just out there trying to convince people medical history is fascinating. You know, I always tell people, even if you don't like history, you might like medical history because everybody knows what it's like to be sick. And, you know, what I do as a medical historian is I can tell you what would happen if you had a toothache in 1793 or you needed a leg (laughs) removed in 1845. So I fill in these really random, you know, spaces. I have no practical skills, but that's kind of (laughs) <laughs> what I do. Well, as a you've done fine story. for yourself, yeah. I think. Yeah. Exactly. Well, I want to actually want to start. So you got your PhD um, in uh, at the University of Oxford. So in the history of science and medicine. So when you were getting your PhD, did you where did you think your life was going to go? Like <laughs> during <here>. your PhD. <laughs> um, you know, I went. So I I fell in love with medical history. It's a very niche subject, as you can imagine. Oxford has a great program. So I did my master's. I did my PhD there. I ended up doing my postdoc, which I started a few days after finishing the PhD. And in the process of doing the postdoc, I became intellectually burned out. And I started a blog called The Surgeon's Apprentice. And it was really a way to teach myself to fall in love with the subject again. You know, all the things about the past that made me excited, but don't make it into academic articles or books. And I found out that there were other people out there who were interested in reading my writing and I enjoyed writing for a lay audience. And so it kind of all started like that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it is such a fascinating uh, uh, area that you, that you cover in your writing. And I I totally agree. Very accessible to not, not just people in medicine uh, because the history of medicine there's just so many twists and turns and just really strange things that 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 have happened to get us to this point 
Uh, and you wrote first came up with the idea for your first uh, book in it was 2016. I know it was published uh, in 2017. 20, 2015, yeah. 2015. And I know like the story of the Genesis, how, how did you come up with this idea for writing the, this, the butchering art, which is your it's first gonna book? It's going to give you a sociopath. <laughs> Let's just get that out of the way right it's now. Gonna, it's going to get a little bit dark, the story. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So what happened was, you know, I, I had done my PhD, my postdoc, and I was writing this blog. And in 2015, I was in Chicago visiting my grandmother. And I went, I came back to London where I had, I was living at the time. And my now ex-husband was gone. Not like Dateline gone, like not like in kind of like a, you know, like I found his body somewhere. That's another book. That's, a different <laughs> That's another book. book. Yeah, exactly. But he he was gone. He had moved out. And this was a 10 year relationship. I didn't know where he was. And oh, <laughs> so the clock kind of started at that moment. And I found out, you know, spoiler alert, I became a cliche. He'd run off with a very young woman. Um, but oh. what had happened was I was on a marriage visa in the UK. So he reported me as illegally in the UK saying that the marriage was over. So they told me you're going to be deported. You have to get ready for that. So I ended up writing a 500 page petition. And at the same oh time, God. I wrote the proposal for the butchering art because I couldn't work. I wasn't allowed to work because I was technically illegally in the UK. So I thought, oh, gosh, I don't know if I could ever sell a book. I don't know if anybody would read anything like this. Um, but I, I came across Joseph Lister's story, whom the first book is about, and people might know Lister through Listerine. Um, he didn't create Listerine, but it was named for him. And it wasn't even used in the 19th century as a mouthwash. It was actually used to treat gonorrhea, which is not a tip. Very but different. That wasn't, that wasn't not medical advice. Use. Yeah, no, not <laughs> medical advice at all. Um, hashtag not that kind of doctor. Um, so... <laughs> But, Lis but Lister was really important because he married germ theory to medical practice. And so we were able to do all these wonderful things and operate uh, in, with antisepsis and antiseptic. And nobody had told this story in a big narrative way. And I thought, I mean, I'm still quite surprised. Like every time I go around talking about this book, I think somebody's going to stand up in the audience and say, did you know somebody wrote this book about five years before you wrote yours? But, um, I, you know, it was just a real luck uh, that I came across this, that I decided to write it. And in the midst of the divorce, I had to move further afield. I was living in Westminster, so very central, and I couldn't afford to live there. So I moved uh, further up north and I ended up moving very close to where Lister was buried just by coincidence. Hmm. Oh, and wow. so I would visit his grave and um, it, it just was, it just all kind of fell into place. And so what happened was I took him to court. I took the ex-husband to court. I fought him in court. We ended up settling in court, and wow. a, I think it was a week later, I sold the book for more money than I ever thought I could make as a writer, and literally 12 hours later, the home office in Britain got back to me, and they gave me a permanent visa to stay in the UK, oh so my God. everything oh, wow. worked out. Wow. Right yeah. at the same time there, <laughs> down to the wire. I, it I was, just, yeah. So wait, a 500-page petition you wrote? Yeah, while writing a book. While well, writing yeah. a book? Oh, How, I'm, what's I'm your secret? Your secrets. What is your yes. secret to productivity here? How do you it write was, that much? <laughs> survival. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's, a, that's a big motivation. Oh my, God. Um, my divorce lawyer uh, is is a good friend of mine now. And I actually thanked her in the butchering art. And the New York Times mentioned that I thanked my divorce lawyer, which they thought was quite <laughs> funny. Um, but she really went to the mattresses for me. But I had friends. I have One of my friends is the Raven Master at the Tower of London. He lives at the Tower and he takes care of the ravens. And he wrote a, a letter on on the official queen's leather letterhead and so all of that really helped oh, to kind of convince of them support. that okay maybe you know she's she's valuable on some level but i feel really lucky to have gone through that and you know what i always say that joseph lister probably saved more lives than any other person to live when you think <laughs> about germ theory and he also saved mine because it lifted me out of this terrible situation yeah D <laughs> did you consider leaving the uk and coming back to the states i just at, I like loved, during all this no because well i mean i couldn't leave at all because once i was declared illegal if i had left the uk i would have forfeited oh. my right to come back so there was that oh, but wow, what okay. was so uh 
unnerving about the whole thing was that they told me that, um, so he had, he had actually emailed me before I flew back and he said the marriage was over and I didn't know what was going on. So they told me that because he had told me this while I was out of the country, when I entered the UK, I had technically illegally entered the UK, even though all my stuff was here, you know, because the, the visa was like, the wording is something like you're, you're in a knowing uh, you know, relationship that's long term, and I guess at that point I I knew that maybe the marriage was over. So it was it was such a crazy time. And I you feel really... like one email out of the blue that says a marriage is over is not right. substantial <laughs> enough to be convinced. I know right. a ten year relationship, like <laughs> yeah. What? You remember that Sex in the City episode with the like? I felt like the, everything in my life had become <laughs> this like weird cliche, and I was I was thirty. I think I was 33 at the time. And, and I called one of my friends and she was, there was like this pause and she was like, I feel like we're too young to be having this conversation. Like he ran off with a young woman. I was like, I know it was, it was just outrageous. You are a young woman. I know. Apparently I aged out of marriage. So, you know, (laughs) yeah. Um, and, and when I sold the book, he came knocking. So that was fun. Of course. Wanted to know how much I had sold it for. And I never disclosed that. So, uh, yeah, I hope he's what? following my career. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a stand up guy. That's yeah. uh, <laughs> and so you're so you sold this book and then you're you're how does it work? Do you, you sell the idea of the book and then you That's write right. the book? Is yeah, that, so so for works? nonfiction, you write a proposal. So you sell it as as essentially an idea, but it's quite a well formed thing. I think um for the butchering art, I had written the prologue. Um, and several, uh, another sample chapter and then a full outline. So they are quite lengthy with fiction. If anybody's out there kind of interested, you write the entire novel first and then you sell it. So it's a lot of work uh, and risk up front wow. and then you try to sell it backwards. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so yeah, I, I sold the butchering art and I just, it was amazing reception of that book. And I hope that yeah. it gets made into a movie someday. Cause I feel like Lister's yeah. story really deserves an epic Hollywood you know, movie about this guy who nobody believes, you know, is saying that germs exist. And, you know, to put yourself in that mindset, like that must have seemed very strange to just your general lay person in the population at the time that like there's these tiny little microscopic bug things that you can't see, but I swear they're there and they're what's making you sick. And granted, people have believed a lot weirder things than that. But like, I can see how there would have been some skepticism before you know, everyone yeah. had the general education about yeah. I mean, all of that. you almost say it exactly how I describe to audiences, because a, a lot of people say, I don't understand how they couldn't accept germ theory. But you're exactly mm-hmm. right. You know, he's he's coming along. He's saying there's these invisible creatures and they're killing your yeah. patients. Like, and, okay, guy. you know, yeah. And you got to <laughs> believe me. And I'm using the microscope, which wasn't really used in medicine at the time. So there's a lot of reasons why people and, and remember, too, that speed for so long was crucial to surgery. And so when you talk about an antiseptic environment, you're naturally slowing everything down. So you're going mm-hmm. against all the old training that these surgeons had gone through. And I think that the other part of that story was that he was, you know, inadvertently saying, you've been killing your patients. And I think that was yeah. a really hard pill for a lot of these surgeons right. to swallow because, you know, sure. as as crazy as these Victorian surgeries war. And, you know, there's stories of, for instance, this guy, Robert Liston, he was the fastest knife in the West End. He could hold you down with his left arm and take your leg off in about 30 seconds. And there's stories of like patients jumping off the table and he runs after them and drags them back. And, and, you know, it's, it's kind of humorous as that is to us today. Imagine how frustrating that would be to go into that operating theater and every time your patient is dying. So, you know, they were in the business of saving lives. And I think that that part of Lister almost accusing them of having done something that actually was killing their patients was really difficult to accept. Right. Especially because you're doing it in good faith. You think you're helping. Exactly. Well, just the courage, the courage it took for him to do that. And and I, it's it's I, and I love I think what speaks to you you mentioned that you know, the lay audience you you were surprised by how much just the general audience not medical audience you know was interested in the story yeah it's it's the narrative structure that you have and and the and the storytelling that's just so captivating that like this is a true thing that happened but it 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 does seem like straight out of a movie right it's I, I, I just couldn't believe the way it, it all you know. unfolded. The prologue opens with um, Robert Liston, the fastest knife in the West End, doing the first ever surgery in Britain under ether. And he doesn't and Liston doesn't think it's going to work. And it does. And it's this miracle. 
And um, I started the story there because I couldn't believe it that at that demonstration was a 17-year-old Joseph Lister. And what Mm. happens after the advent of anesthesia is that surgery actually becomes much more dangerous because surgeons don't understand germs, but they can go deeper into the body. They no longer are fighting the patient, so they're more willing to pick up the knife. So I thought, this is such a great moment. You have Liston with the ether, and then you have Lister in the audience who's going to solve the greatest medical mystery of all time. And I thought, you know, if I was a script writer, nobody would believe this story. And it was all true. And (laughs) and I just loved bringing that story, you know, to life for everybody. And you, uh, exactly how many hours did you spend at Lister's grave? You mentioned. (laughs) Enough. (laughs) Was it. Did you bring a little desk? Buddies now? Were you probably, writing? Probably, yeah, you know, probably people <laughs> bouncing, <laughs> Actually, I, bouncing I ideas a, off his ghost. <laughs> there was a there was an article in uh, the I think it was like the <laughs> Scotland Herald, and it was something like the caption was something like heartbroken historian sits on Lister's grave and writes his story oh or something like this really romantic oh. take on it. But it was, you know, it's part of the, the, the myth of the butchering art, I guess, you know, but it yeah. was, it was a terrible time. But like I said, it, yeah. it just rebirthed me. And, you know, I never dreamed that I could make a living as a writer. Um, but looking back on everything, you know, I'm a medical historian. I do have a PhD, but I call myself first and foremost, a storyteller. And mm-hmm. I just love that I can tell all these great stories about the medical past, because as we've established, there's only one medical historian, apparently, in the world <laughs> <That's> who, <right. laughs> who's doing stuff. Um, but there aren't, there aren't that many medical historians who are doing stuff commercially. So it's been really right. fun right. to capture the, uh, the imagination of the public through these stories. And so you, you published the book, it's, it's a success, and you're, you're doing a, I'm sure you, you did a tour, right? And you like, did. Story a book book tour and i know that uh, probably some interesting things happened during the book tour uh, yes. just because of the nature of what you're talking about in the book it it can be it's it's graphic there's a lot of weirdos times, out there right <laughs> there's a lot of yeah. i mean i love all the weirdos who are listening i love you guys um but yeah i i right before the book came out um this guy reached out to me and he said that he had carved a skull to honor the butchering art. And I asked him if it was real human skull. And he said he does carve real human skulls, but this was a replica because he knows not everybody likes to have, you know, human skulls hanging out in their house. So I appreciated that. But the crazy thing is, I'm going to show you. So the forehead says the butchering art. I'm going to see if I can hold this up. But so this is a, a, a skull. It looks like a human skull. Oh, and it's it, beautiful. And it, it really is. It's 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 a it's art. Yes, right you there. say that, but here's the crazy bit. Okay. That's me holding a skull on the back oh. of it. Okay. So, so he oh, carved okay. me onto the back of it holding a skull. It's very meta. Okay, now it's creepy. <laughs> yeah. And my, wow. my my then agent was like, oh, good news. I invited him to the launch party. And I said, no, I, I don't know who this guy is. Well, it turns out his name's Zane Wiley. He's actually very nice and he does these props and stuff. But that definitely, that could have turned into a Dateline episode too, I yeah. feel. <laughs> yes. That's right. You attract so, some very interesting people, yeah. I have to say. You so must have was, some stories. Yeah, the that was definitely one of the, the weirdest. The Carved Skull. Uh, yeah. That's what the Dateline episode <laughs> would be skull called. skull with your face yeah. on it. Yeah. Is, how, how do I have to sit something. with that yeah. for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> that is interesting. How do people react like in person to hearing you t- uh, describe like legs being amputated yeah. and There's a lot of gore there yeah. is yeah and i don't pull punches because you know i i you yeah. know i've been criticized but one critic said you know oh she kind of relishes it's not that it's if, well number one if you read the butchering art a lot of the descriptions are from the doctors and patients themselves i'm using their words to describe these scenes but Also, I don't feel like I would be doing these patients justice if I wasn't explaining exactly what that experience was like, because like it or not, you know, medicine owes a lot to their bodies. We've learned a lot from operating on these people. So I always, you know, tell it full. But as I was going around the country on book tour, I had four men faint. It's always men. I'm not making any further commentary. I'm just saying it is always (laughs) men who seem to faint. I get it. There was Absolutely. one guy who fainted and we got him to his feet and then he fainted again. So <laughs> that was, that was pretty bad for that guy. So I don't, I, and you know, it's not that anything is overly graphic in my presentations, but I think people's imaginations are very yes. strong. And so when I talk about, you know, having your leg amputated without any anesthetic, I think people in their minds put themselves on that table. And a friend of mine, who's a filmmaker 
he shot a book trailer and we shot it in the old operating theater in London, which is the second oldest in the world. And we had great actors and we reenacted this pre-anesthetic scene with a young Lister watching. And we don't show the leg being sawn off, but what we do is the saw falls off the table and Lister goes down to pick it up and you see the blood coming off the table. So again, it's kind of gives that sense that, and we picked the biggest actor we could find to put on the table. So you really think about like how much strength would it take to take this guy's leg off? And that's when people tend to faint when I show that trailer. They just, that really... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> doesn't so sit a, well yeah. with so it's an audio visual experience here yeah, this it is, is, yeah. it's good i'm trying yeah. to like i said i'm trying to convince people that this movie should exist but um everybody's got to get over the queasiness of victorian surgery to make that happen that's right. thank <laughs> goodness for anesthesia oh my gosh absolutely well, well your your description of of you know how you want you want to tell the stories of these people because as gory as it is it's true like this is what the what it was like I think that's a good segue into into your new book coming yes. out, um, and uh, it's called The Face Maker. And tell us a little bit about it and the uh, yeah, what so, led to the idea. So the Face Maker, um, it's coming out in paperback on Tuesday, but it's been out in hardback for a year. It's about the pioneering surgeon Harold Gillies, who some people call the father of modern plastic surgery, and he was rebuilding soldiers' faces during the First World War. So this is the first major conflict where you're getting large numbers of casualties with facial injuries. In fact, I think by the end of World War I, there was something like 280,000 men from France, Britain, and Germany alone who suffered some form of facial trauma. So Gillies and his team step in and they have no textbooks to guide them and they're having to rebuild these faces without antibiotics. Anesthesia is very rudimentary at this point. And it's an incredible story. And it's it's called The Face Maker, but it's not just about Gillies. It's as much about Gillies as it is about his, his these disfigured soldiers whom he treated. So it's been a real honor to tell those stories and, and very different than the butchering art, which, you know, like the Victorians are quite yeah. crazy and we can kind of laugh at that and stuff. But but this is different. It, it had a more it was it was a weightier uh, subject. I worried that my readers would, you know, maybe be turned off going into the 20th century. But it hit the New York Times bestseller list because everybody's been so supportive. And it's just been great to convince Americans especially Americans who don't really engage with World War One, that this is a story mm-hmm. worth hearing. So it's been great. Yeah, it's um, I'm, I'm working my way. I haven't, I haven't read the whole thing yet, but it's it's fascinating. And just the the care and attention that you have paid to the survivors, these um, the people that survived the war and, and went through all these and the just the the the, the public reaction I was surprised yeah. by that, and and you talked a lot about this, uh, how how these people with facial disfigurements were received by the public compared right. to people who had other injuries. Yeah, I often say that this was a time when losing a limb made you a hero, but losing a face made you a monster. And in mm-hmm. fact, these men, when they left the hospital grounds, they were forced to sit on brightly painted blue benches so that the public knew not to look at them. This was a very isolating. Uh, you know, injury, and they were called the loneliest Tommies. And, you know, what Gillies was able to do was not just mend their broken faces, but also mend their broken spirits. This is about identity. It's about what it means to have a face and to lose a face and also to regain a new kind of face. So, For example, there was a a story of a guy named Private Walter Ashworth who lays on the battlefield for three days, unable to scream for help because he has no jaw. And eventually he's taken off the field. Now, one of the reasons these guys were left behind was because oftentimes, I mean, I don't have to tell you guys, the face is very vascular, it bleeds heavily. And so the stretcher bearers just thought, you know, they're not going to survive. And the the stretcher bearers are targets themselves. They had to make very quick decisions. So Ashworth lays out there for three days. He's finally rescued. He's sent to Gilly's hospital. While he's there, his fiance breaks off the engagement, which was a very common thing for these men. And in the course of that, the friend, the fiance's friend gets word of this. And she, she starts writing letters to Ashworth. And soon they fall in love and they get married. Eventually, Ashworth is discharged. He goes back to work as a tailor's assistant. 
And his old boss makes him work at the back of the shop so that he doesn't frighten the customers in, in the boss's wards. And so Ashworth feels very hurt by this. You know, I say in The Face Maker that not all wounds were inflicted on the battlefield at this time. Mm-hmm. And so he and his wife move to Australia. And many, many years later, Harold Gillies ends up over there. He's lecturing and he bumps into his old patient. And he's delighted to see Ashworth. And he says that he'd like to have another go at his face. I hear that doctors are very competitive and they they, they never really <laughs> give up, right? So, right. you know, as a surgeon would do, he wanted to have another go. He felt he had learned a lot in those years. And Ashworth actually declined. And his great niece said it was because he had made peace with the face he had been given and that that face had given him happiness. And so I think really the face maker is about identity. And Gillies himself was extraordinary. He does the first phalloplasty on a trans man in the 1940s named Michael Dillon. Um, Michael Dillon is actually outed by the British press, and it's this horrible controversy. And Gillies stands by Michael Dillon. So he was very progressive in many ways and um, certainly a a name worthy of being a household name, in my opinion. Yeah, it's fascinating. I noticed uh, the audiobook is read by, is it Daniel Gillies? That's right. Yeah. Is that a relation? Yes. So, and Daniel Gillies is a very good looking guy, which I think is very ironic <laughs> because, you know, <laughs> he's the great, great nephew of, of Sir Harold Gillies. And um, I, I joked on Twitter because the butchering art was read by a guy named Ralph Lister, who's a voice actor. And Ralph Lister just happened to be related to Joseph <laughs> Lister. And How I thought, funny. wow, how weird is that? You know? So I joked when I was writing The Face Maker that Daniel Gillies should do the Audible book. And he agreed. And it's great. He's been in the Vampire Diaries. Like, he's a proper Hollywood actor. And so we're talking about possibly doing a TV adaptation with him playing his great, great uncle. And oh. he's told me some great stories, too, about sort of Gillies after the war. And it's been good fun for him because, he, of course, he knew about uh, Harold Gillies, but he didn't know, you know, all the details about everything mm-hmm. he did. So I hope that, you know, every writer hopes that their stuff is adapted. But I think that showing these disfigured soldiers would be powerful because Hollywood often portrays villains as disfigured, you know? And right. when I say that to people, they're like, they, they stop and think about it, but think Darth Vader, um, Joker, Harvey Dent mm-hmm. becomes evil after he's disfigured. Mm-hmm. Um, you have Voldemort, you have all the Bond villains. I mean, the list goes on and on. And so it would be great to show this in a way that's uplifting and heroic and uh, and to show their faces as they were meant to be seen. So not put them on those blue benches today. Yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I got to ask, between the two books, how many, uh, I guess, which book has caused more people to faint during a lot of readings? (laughs) I guess that's my question. It's definitely the butchering art. You know, actually the face (laughs) maker, when I started the tour last June, I... I practice my talks quite heavily. So when I go in front of an audience, it's pretty rehearsed. And I was uh, speaking about Ashworth and I said, you know, I want to tell you a story that will hopefully haunt you for a long time after you leave. I'm going to tell you about what it's like to lay in a battlefield for three days without a jaw and able to scream for help. And then I show his photo, his injury photo. And seeing their faces looking at his face was very emotional for me because, again, these these Uh. men were very much hidden. And even the photos are protected from the Royal College of Surgeons in London. I did get permission to use them in my book, but they're very protective of them. They don't like Mm -hmm. them to just be shown um, without context. So it's been kind of moving to interact with audiences. And, of course, in the UK, it's been brilliant because... I meet people who have actual connections to Gillies. You know, my grandfather was operated on by Gillies or I met one of his nurses, um, which was extraordinary. So it's been fun going oh, wow. around the UK yeah. with this book. Just, oh. <laughs> yeah, send me, send me an address and we'll, say, we'll get you guys a copy. Yeah, it's, it's good fun. Well, let's take a quick break and then we'll come back with Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. Hey, Kristen, you know why a stethoscope is so hard to use? Um, because there's no heartbeat in an eyeball. That's actually a really good point. Uh-huh. But also, the, the heart is quiet. The, the, mm. the sounds are somewhat distant. And sometimes you're in a noisy environment and you're trying to listen mm. to all the, the beeps and boops and whatever other noises there are in the heart. Uh, but 
with Echo Health's 3M Litman Core Digital Stethoscope. It's easier than ever. You get 40 times sound amplification, mm. active background noise cancellation. Honestly, even an ophthalmologist could figure it out. I also really could have used one of those before I had to do 10 minutes of CPR on you. Yeah. It leads to earlier detection, better outcomes, something that's definitely meaningful for us. And we have a special offer for our U.S. listeners. Visit echohealth.com slash KKH and use code NOC50 to experience Echo's digital stethoscope technology. That's E-K-O health slash K-K-H and use NOC50 to get $50 off plus a free case plus free engraving with this exclusive offer. All right, we are back uh, with Dr. Fitzharris, uh, best-selling author of a couple of my favorite books right now. Um, which we uh, talked about. Well, let's we're gonna do something a little bit different now. We're going to play a little game uh, that we call medical marvels or myths. Medical marvels okay. or myths. So it's it's a a random list of. Um, <laughs> as far as I know, I haven't seen this list. Okay, this is Kristen is uh, spearheading this. Endeavor, okay, <laughs> so you can blame her. Um, <laughs> but basically, it's it's like I I think it's a list of of well, you tell us. Well, so it's a list of of you know various treatments and medical um, you know practices and philosophies okay. throughout history, and um, you're you guys are gonna tell me whether it was successful or not. Yes, yeah. essentially, okay. right. And if it is, it's a medical marvel, and if not, it, it's a myth. So okay. it's if, if if they have an actual medical like indication that. Would be yes useful if by at some modern point standards, in life. We we know that this is an effective practice. Has some okay, okay got, got you. it. All right, okay. All right, who wants to who do you, who do you want to go first? Oh God, Me, we'll um, see. let's have our guests go first. Yes, of All course. Right. Yes, let's have. <laughs> okay, um, tobacco smoke enemas. <laughs> Yeah, that's definitely a myth. <laughs> that was a, that was a way they tried to resuscitate people from drowning in the past. That was good fun you, back in the 18th. You've heard century. of that? Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. Of course you do. Of course yeah. you do. Yes, this is what she does. <laughs> it's Why in the children's book. Smoke animals. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> that's in the children's book. Oh yeah. Hey, I don't pull punches. Well, kids, the kids an are enema. Hear <laughs> yeah. Love it. They're gonna hear about it all. But yeah, it was an it was an early way to resuscitate people. And um, did it? do anything no, no did, why it, did they think it would do anything they didn't understand respiratory at the time so i guess they thought oh. blowing smoke up the butt would help i don't know so that's probably where that phrase comes from yeah, right it, yeah blowing smoke up your ass yeah. Yeah. yeah i think uh it, pretty much people have tried if, if you could stick something into the rectum <laughs> like it has been tried happen, in yeah. history it what seems. is the fascination with that why does everyone uh, it's, that it's, seems to it's a hole you gotta put some in it i don't know <laughs> yes i'm glad you said it and not me because i was thinking the same thing and i'm like i don't want to be like you know it gets cut into some viral like song yeah that'll be the sound bite right <laughs> yeah i don't want to be in that song so <laughs> all right so that one's a myth okay clearly. yes no one try tobacco smoke enemas please <laughs> Okay, um, Will, bloodletting. Oh, that's that's a myth. Ooh, is so it blood... tricky though? <laughs> oh, oh, blood bloodletting is is like to like to make someone bleed to to remove the bad blood, the poisoned blood. Mm. I don't know. Is there is there actually actually a useful like historical? Well, so yeah, you're right that. The, the reasons they did it in the past, it was bullshit. It, you know, it didn't work. Yeah. It was, they believed in um, the four humors. So you had four humors in your body and when they became out of, if they came out of balance, then they would bloodlet you and that would restore balance. And actually George Washington ended up dying because they bled, they took too much blood. They hastened his death. Oh no. Um, oh, I mean, he I probably would that. have died. He had, Poor he had George Washington. Yeah. <laughs> and he called for it too, by the way. He had an upper respiratory infection and he said, bleed me, you know, and, and they did. <laughs> and it did not end well for him so Yikes. i wonder if they letting... tried the tobacco smoke enema first <laughs> yeah. yeah or after maybe. he died oh, yeah. and then they right. tried to 
Oh, oh all the things to think about. Um, yeah. But yeah, no. So, so the reasons they did it in the past, of course, you know, we know now therapeutically wouldn't have worked. But actually, I wrote an article for the New Scientist uh, in the last few years, and bloodletting has returned as a remedy for certain conditions. Um, there's a condition, and it's such a long word, I'm not even going to pretend to pronounce it. But essentially, I think you 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 have like too much iron. Um, and oh, yeah. so he- hemochromatosis. Yeah, that's right. And so yeah. it, it, oh, if they find that small amounts of bloodletting can be beneficial in those cases. I guess that's true. Yeah, it's like a modern form of bloodletting. Right. Yeah. So you're they just letting the iron out. Yeah, but they yeah. don't call blood. it bloodletting anymore. No, they don't bring they, it out. But they I think it. they should. <laughs> there should be an ICD code. Yeah. You could just yeah. like call <laughs> bloodletting. What do they uh, call it now? Uh, I don't know. It's a hemodialysis a form yeah. of that. I don't, I, I don't know for they sure. They should call exactly. it yeah. bloodletting. I mean, that would be much more <laughs> should, I guess amusing. Right, yeah. like, hemodialysis, where you're removing the blood. Well, you're removing, you are removing the blood, running it through a machine. It's pulling out the like things you don't want in the blood. So I guess that is technically it's a, a form of bloodletting, like I a suppose, modern yeah. form of bloodletting. Yeah. So. so do you just have to be on that constantly? Because I mean, you're just no. You do. I think you're not really you, treating the source of the cause of, of too much iron right you're well, just cleaning it out once for it's already some conditions been dumped in. you are but then for some you do have to like three times a week you gotta yeah. go in and do it get the yeah. iron removed yeah hmm. so. there you go well there you go <laughs> a trick question okay. <laughs> that's yeah, right <laughs> okay dr fateris therapeutic use of radium Oh, this is tricky too, right? Because, you know, some uses, of course, would have been beneficial, but also harmful because of the way we administered it. Um, So I would say it's a marvel because we ended up figuring out how to harness it. But there were definitely, I mean, I actually just did a radio program in London and I was talking to a scientist who is working on injectable uh, radiation um, in in cancer patients. And some of this technology is, you know, in the next five or 10 years, it's going to be a real game changer, especially for recurrence, Mm. because it can go all around the body and it's more specific. So uh, yeah, I would say a marvel, but of course, with the caveat that we probably killed a lot of people and technicians themselves die because they were exposed to this stuff. And we, you know, Marie Curie, she, she's like, that's everything in medicine. Exactly. Her corpse is still radioactive. Like it's in a lead oh, mine wow. coffin and, you know, <laughs> her, her diaries and her letters are all um, protected as well in lead line boxes and you can't actually view them unless you're wearing Dang. protective gear. So, yeah. So wow. Marvel, but definitely kill people as well. <laughs> yeah. One to be very careful with. That's that would be a tough job. Well, it's, it's radium because radium, figure out. certainly you talked about cancer. Yeah. It's like, you know, you can isolate the isotope or whatever and you know, probably yeah. use that in some chemotherapeutic regimens and right. Yeah. So and like actually, to be to be the person having you don't to... like drink radium. No. Like just <laughs> put it in a, you know. Well, it does say in the early 20th century, That's one true. of the things they tried was they put it in toothpaste and they also uh had a product, maybe you've heard of this. Let's see, Rivigator? <laughs> I Riv- haven't heard of that. Rivigator? One. But I know that water there was... with radium dissolved into yeah. it. Yeah, oh, and there was okay. radi- There was radium condoms. <laughs> oh, for a while. Boy. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll tweet those at you guys, and you can share that. But <laughs> oh, yeah, there was all please, there was all do. kinds of weird stuff. In fact, um, there's a friend of mine, Lucy Santos, wrote a fantastic book on the history of radium. So she'd be a good guest for the show. But it's uh, there's a lot of weird stuff we did with it before we kind of figured out this wasn't I... wasn't a good thing. I think we figured out that's the subject of your next book, uh, <laughs> yeah. the 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 history of condoms. Yeah, the history of con- I did I did a YouTube video <laughs> I, on the history of condoms, and I I dressed up in an inflatable condom outfit because that's what you do for YouTube. You have to do like these ridiculous things to get people's attention, and I told the history of condoms on the YouTube channel. So. But actually, my, my is, next book that is, is dedication. Because yeah, I, because I'm always plugging wow. my books, but my next my, my next book is um on a guy named Joseph Bell. Have you heard of Bell's palsy? You, uh, obviously, yeah. yeah. So his uh, grandfather named Bell's palsy, but Joseph Bell was the professor of Arthur Conan Doyle, and he was the real life Sherlock Holmes, and he was the inspiration for the character. So it's all going to be about oh, uh, Victorian wow. forensics. He worked on the Ripper case, and it's it's just going to be really fun to go back to the 19th century with that story. Oh, that sounds really yeah. interesting. Oh, do you just have like a long list of of these 
subjects stories. that you can yeah, yeah, yeah. seriously there's like there's so many of them and uh, that's I such a good it. idea for a, anyway yeah what is it about the 19th century that is why is all of this happening <laughs> i know and, it's, and, and you know what's uh, great is it's so well documented with the 20th century actually interestingly something i hadn't predicted and i should have as a historian was when i got into the case notes of the patients the disfigured soldiers in in the face maker um i there was patient confidentiality so Gillies wrote about some of these patients publicly. I could use all that. It was in the public domain. But if I went into the case notes and found something that he hadn't mentioned in the in the book that he published, I couldn't use that detail in relation to their name. And I also mm. had to prove that these guys were dead. I mean, can you imagine if I had found out that one of them was still like is 145 years old? And yeah. Um, so yeah, there was it was a real weird process. So I like to go back to the 19th century where I don't have to deal with patient confidentiality and it's a little bit easier to write about. Right. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I wouldn't have thought about that. Yeah. Okay, Will, your turn. Um, let me see. Trepanation. Mm. Oh, that's that's okay. So <laughs> yeah, I was this waiting for be... that. Yeah, I, yeah. Think you, I think you thought of <laughs> So there's I mean, you, the word like conjures myth because when it was initially done it was like to let spirits out of the brain or, or something like that yeah so tell people what it but, is so trepanation i believe is just making a hole in the skull yeah. you're just like poking a hole in the, in the skull <laughs> yeah. to you know like and a hole so, punch <laughs> yeah like a hole punch basically yeah. <laughs> so, it was, so it was very violent yeah. and probably deadly when it was first done but but now like we do craniotomies like we do um, to to release pressure from any number of things, hemorrhagic strokes and cerebral edema. Like there's a, there's reasons why you would you would create an opening to decompress the brain. So I guess that would be a modern form of trepanation. Yeah, and sure. it wasn't Again. always um, done to release the evil spirits, but it was sometimes just done to release pressure. And we know that the patients were surviving because in the bioarchaeological evidence, you can see the regrowth of bone in the skulls, which is is quite incredible. You would think walking around oh, with a yeah. hole in your skull before germ theory and, you know, that would yeah, be a death be a sentence. Problem. But people were actually surviving it in some cases. And there's, there's a lot of um, great, human remains at the Mütter Museum in Philadelphia, if you ever get a chance to visit. Also um, out in London at the Hunterian. It's a fantastic collection. So if you guys are interested in dead things in jars, highly recommend those museums. <laughs> and you get to see, and what's fascinating for doctors especially, is you get to see diseases in their you know, late stages where you wouldn't see that now because we've eradicated them or we can treat them. So like syphilis, for instance, causes a lot of um, bone deterioration in the skull. And you can see that in these collections, whereas now you treat it with, you know, antibiotics. So it's it's fascinating from that viewpoint, too, that doctors can see this stuff before, you know, where yeah. before we eradicate it or we're able to treat it. Yeah. Just so we know, how many dead things in jars do you have right now? <laughs> and are any of them in I, those jars behind you? I'm not seeing you? any on your have, back Actually, here. I do have, I do have, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I have like a wall of terrible faces that show leprosy yeah. and syphilis and all kinds of things. That and was that's from, just for the, the listener. That is just hanging in. In yeah. what appears to be your home. It's just, yes. yeah, it is my home. It's just hanging out there. <laughs> it's uh, it's from my TV show, The Curious Life and Death of, that I, I filmed for the Smithsonian. Yeah. It was a prop. And so I took all the creepy props with me. Um, oh, and, and we did a show on Houdini, you know, that that story about how he was punched in the stomach. And he, and then there was this yeah. this idea that maybe he was killed by the spiritualist. So we kind of unpack, like, how do these how do these people really die? And we rebuilt the torture water torture chamber that he would hang upside down in. And at the end of the uh, series, I said, who's what's happening to this? And everybody's like nothing and i said send it to me <laughs> <laughs> so i'm turning it into a bookcase and i'm in the middle of a house move right now so it, i can't wait till the movers show up and they're like what oh, is yeah. all what of is this it's this? <laughs> terrible it's going to be great yeah, it's going to be you're, horrible you're, it's going to end up being, you know, the haunted. Yeah, you're going to be the story those movers tell to their grandkids. From like, Absolutely, you know, 40 yeah. years down the road. Yeah. Actually, these guys, these movers are from London and they moved me during my divorce. So they saw me like at my divorce. This is years ago, you know. And so they're coming back. So they already know I'm weird and I got lots of <laughs> weird story back, like life stories and stuff. Yeah. So I thought, OK, they did a good job. They didn't break anything because that's the problem. Because I do. So I have some yeah. uh, I have a human spine back there um but i don't really have 
that's the only they human have, like, remains a license I have. to own human well, remains. That's the thing. Those are uh, ex medical. Good question. Um, and they're they're okay. pre like nineteen twenty. So that's the key is that they have oh. to be old and me- like ex medical. And really, if you're interested, I'm not really interested in human remains, like owning them. Um, but if you are, you really need to look at the person selling to make sure that they're ethical. Um, because you yeah. can get into trouble, yeah. of course, with this. You don't stuff. want to be on the human remains black yeah. market. No, you don't want to be like the guy like <laughs> digging up the skulls in the local graveyard and selling them. So yeah, so that's the only human remains I have. But then I, I because I did this YouTube series, we've like recreated lots of stuff. We have the barber's pole, which you probably know was an mm-hmm. early advertising for bloodletting. They used to tie bloody rags to the pole and it would whip around this pole and it would create that red and white stripe that we're familiar with today. So I got the barber's pole and I, I have a full size Muppet. Uh, there he is. Because of course you do. Because <laughs> inexplicably, I thought, oh, this will be great for the YouTube series. So I don't do the YouTube series anymore because it's too much work and I got to get writing. Yeah. But I, I love have, collecting weird stuff. Do you still have the, the condom costume? I do. Yeah. yeah I, know. Okay. I went through the box right. of like props and I'm like, oh, yeah. it's such a good, it's such good memories. You, you of might use costume. it for Halloween. I'm, I'm not Never one know. to speak. I, I have, I have plenty of my own props. So yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, you know. Weird costumes. Let's do, okay, let's, let's do, do one more. Let's do one more. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Dr. Fitaris, we'll end on this one. Medical leeches. Again, another tricky one. So, you know, obviously they use leeches for bloodletting in the past. And in fact, there was the leech craze of the 19th century, Kristen. Like they, they loved the weird shit in the they 19th century. They were experimenting Yeah, back they then. loved that. And the, and the women, it was so profitable to get these leeches. They would wade out into the rivers with, and lift up their skirts and let the leeches get onto their legs. And then they would sell them to doctors. So there was like the leech craze of the 19th century. But nowadays we, we do use leeches <laughs> in medicine. Farming leeches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. We do use them in medicine, but not for the same reason. So I think they're used to reduce scarring in some cases. I, th- I think actually even it cosmetically can be used to reduce scarring. Um, but yeah, I, I heard that occasionally the doctors today will break out the leeches, but it's it's probably a rare do I, do this they? occurrence. Says, this says leeches secrete natural anticoagulants and can help promote blood flow and treat certain conditions like venous congestion venous oh. congestion okay yeah and it but promotes now healing, granted I think, this is too. from um chat gpt so uh, yeah there you go Fact well, check well, it. Who knows? Right. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but I, th- I think plastic surgeons might even use them occasionally i think it reduces scarring but i mean you got to get over the psychological aspect of having a leech yeah you know on right. you. i don't think i would like sucked that by a what are they? Are they're not an insect? They're a. If, if they... anybody's listening, that's put a leech on a person for a therapeutic benefit. Let it. <laughs> Who like, is a licensed physician? Yeah. Send, send us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly. Send, <laughs> send us a message. Us, I don't want wanna, other kinds of leech stories. We want to hear from you. Yeah, just FYI, now that you're having me on as a guest, be prepared for all the weirdos to come to your podcast now. <laughs> that's so. right. Yeah. Hey, we we have we had, uh, you know welcome, we welcome them, them with them. open we are arms. Weirdos. Love the weirdos. Yeah, <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm one of them so you know you've opened the flood us too <laughs> yeah okay i have a very well, important question before we let you go how do you survive working with your husband oh asking that's for a really- friend. <laughs> <laughs> You know what? It's been. I'm the easiest one to work with. What are you talking about? <laughs> it's actually wonderful. We're both creative, and and it's been so nice because he knows how creatively you can get drained quite quickly. And during the pandemic, we both were working from home, and he's the principal caricaturist on a show over here called Spitting Image, and they build these life size caricature puppets of. I mean, this this sounds absolutely madness. Just Google it, guys. It's crazy. <laughs> and um, so so during the pandemic, this awful moment, you know, he's there you know, doing all these caricatures of, you know, Trump and Biden and, and they created all of these puppets and it's, it's been great fun. And I just love it. And so we're actually going to be writing the second children's book together. So we get out, we bump along very well oh, that's awesome. and uh, hopefully he doesn't disappear on me one day, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like the earlier iteration and there's not a Dateline episode, but no, I, I love him. And it's, it's been really fun to work with him on Plague Busters. It's very cool. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Um, this is, <laughs> I feel like I, I just want to hear like more I know. medical I just history wanna, like, stories. I just want to come to your house, take a tour of your shelves. I yeah, know. Exactly. Well, we could, talk I, you know, you we could, for a long time. Adrian and I would love to come back for Plague Busters and talk to you about all the weird stories we uncovered about smallpox. And, you know, I, I joked oh, that, yeah. um, 
you know, I've, I've scared you all enough. I'm coming for your kids now. So yeah. we've, we've really <laughs> dug up the, the horrible stories about the past and it's been really good fun. And I think, th- I think well, we actually have kids one will love that. We have one that is your exact target audience. I mean, I, in fact, yeah. I think she might want to be you when she grows up. If she <laughs> heard about you. So <laughs> that is great. Well, I we, saw we her. Loved, cause, yeah. Cause we, we had the, I've, I've had the butchering. I was looking through the butchering art um, this week and I, so I had it out on the table and I saw our 11 year old paging through, through it. Looking through it. Looking through it and well, so. I, I had a 10 year old come to a, a book event for the butchering art and she came and her dad was standing there and I assumed that it was dad, you know, who had brought her. And he said, no, I, I don't even know these books. And she wanted to come. And I said to her, well, what do you want to be? She was 10 years old. I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And without even pausing, she said trauma surgeon. And I was like, whoa. Okay. I was oh, like, she oh, probably man. will be. I mean, it was so specific. Was very specific. You yeah. Know, so sometimes kids, they know right off the bat, you know, what they want yeah. to be. And so I hope that Plague Busters will be, I'll get you guys a copy. I'll get her a copy yeah. and hopefully oh, she'll sure enjoy she learning about that. Yeah. Well, the face maker is out in paperback uh, coming up soon, and um, it's check it out because it's it's riveting. It really is fascinating, and the butchering art also. You got a lot of stuff going on. I do, uh, anything yeah. else we haven't covered? It's, it's all uh, fantastic. But no, what else? It's, uh, it's good. I mean, yeah. I'm catching up for lost time. I, I just really quickly, I got diagnosed with breast cancer last year in the oh middle of the, of my book tour, but I'm totally fine. I am completely oh, cancer free. I got to, I got to skip oh. chemo. It was an incidental cancer. I, I felt something. I pushed for the mammogram. They found uh, a cancer hidden deep in the breast. So I'm the luckiest unlucky person. And so oh. my PSA to everyone is if something feels off, get it checked out. It can save your life. And honestly, it was brilliant. And my surgeon who reached out to me on Twitter um, had read the face maker and he's one of the top breast cancer surgeons in London. So just so lucky, but I did have to take basically a year off. So now I'm kind of hitting yeah. the ground running, trying to get back out there. But yeah, anybody out there who's listening, don't put off your mammogram. Don't put off your check. If anything feels off, just make sure you go get it checked out. That's fantastic advice. Yes. Couldn't um, agree more over especially here. Especially <laughs> as, as I've, I've found you know, my cancer, my own cancer twice from a, from a weird lump that was growing. So get your right. lumps and bumps checked out. <laughs> that's people. right. Any lumps. Um, yeah. That's, ex- you know, exactly. I mean, I think people like it, you get a lump and they're like, ah, bodies are weird, but you know, it's sometimes they are also yeah. trying to kill you. So it's, yeah. exactly. it's good to that's get true. it checked out. And the thing about cancer is when it's caught early, it's, it can be very treatable and, and not scary. Um, and so I shared yeah. my story publicly. I wrote about it in the Wall Street Journal because I really wanted people to know that cancer doesn't always have to be fatal or terminal or or come with right. all the scary bits and bobs with it. So, you know, if you're nervous about getting it checked out, just know that yeah. earlier the better. So for peace of mind, yeah, do I it. I think sometimes people put it off because they don't want to know for sure that they have it, right? But but yeah. that's actually... Yeah. The worst possible thing to do because it can be very treatable if it's yeah. early. I mean, a friend of mine said that I, when I was waiting for the biopsy result, I said, oh, I'm nervous to hear the result. And she said, you either have cancer or you don't. And them telling you or not doesn't change the fact that you either have it or you don't. And I thought, oh, yeah, right. that's true. Um, so, you know, I, I actually was really lucky because when I went in, my surgeon said, uh, the, the, the local surgeon, not the surgeon I ended up with, he said, I don't really feel anything. He goes, and anyway, you're 30. And I said, no, no, I'm 40. I just turned 40. And he said, oh, that's the magic number. So he got me the mammogram that day. They mm. kept calling me back for multiple. And I said, is this unusual? And they said, well, boots are weird, you know, so I, I wasn't too anxious. And then the radiologist called me back and she said, are you a medical doctor? And I assured her I have no practical skills. And with that cleared <laughs> up, she started to explain what she was seeing. And I interrupted and I said, are you telling me I have breast cancer? And she didn't say yes or no. She just nodded. And I couldn't believe it. And so at that, she gave me a real warning shot, which I appreciated because, of course, they had to do the biopsy to confirm it. But she knew what she was looking at. And that really kind yeah. of helped me while I was waiting, get into that mindset for that news. So, again, the yeah. luckiest unlucky person. And, um, you know, I always think of, again, the Victorians. Um, there was a guy named William Halstead who invented the radical mastectomy. And he was like, addicted to cocaine and he was he was this crazy guy and and he i mean honestly he was so addicted to cocaine that his friends kidnapped him and put him on a ship to england and let him dry out and um he invented the the radical mastectomy and he would take everything collarbones ribs um and so that 
was kind of the standard nice. until the 1970s, the radical mastectomy. So we've come a really long way and people should know that. Like, I think all in my treatment was about maybe four months. So very, very lucky to skip, you wow. know, like again, to skip the chemo and stuff like that. So, you know, get checked. There's my PSA. Yeah. <laughs> do, you, yeah. do you know who else was addicted to cocaine? Uh, I mean, everybody, the guy, right? <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the past. In that time. The guy, yeah. the guy who set the standard for residency well, work or for physician work hours. Wasn't that Halstead? That was Halstead. Oh, what, oh yeah. that was him. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Same guy. Same guy. I know. Okay. He's got a lot to answer for, that guy. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I he, mean, did a, he did a number guy. on medicine. It My was God. crazy. I, I mean, he was a genius, but yeah, they were all experimenting yeah. with those drugs and they were taking ether and they were having ethereal experiences. And it was, it and was a wild time. 50 hours a week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's, and that's what we have. We have him to blame. <laughs> you can blame right. him for the rest of it. Right. Maybe uh, we can revisit that. Yeah. yeah like, I yeah. think it's time. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> again, thank you so much for coming on and, um, and good luck with your, uh, keep writing, all the books thank we you want, so we want much. to hear all the stories and uh fascinating stuff so i hope everybody checks out um again uh the face maker uh the butchering art and plague busters, plague busters, plague busters. coming out uh and everything that comes after so good luck Excellent. to you and thanks again for coming on thanks for having me on the show well that was absolutely fascinating yeah i could have done that for many more hours that was I, super interesting I, I'd be okay if she's like the only medical historian. I feel like she could. Like, she's got it covered. She's got it covered. She's doing a very like, good job. It's it's awesome, and we didn't get into any eyeball stuff. I know. I so it we'll, just didn't we'll, go there, but I I we'll have to have her back on. I just have for so eyeballs. many burning questions about eyeballs. Maybe burning eyeballs. I don't know. Uh, but that's uh, it was wonderful to have her on. Um, so everybody should check out her books. They really are fascinating and very accessible. Again, to it's a, a really non good storyteller, such good yeah, storytelling. The narrative and the prose is all it, really it just, interesting. Keeps it you just jumps off the page. It's it's it is a little gory, but it's yeah. it's all done for a purpose, and the the message is just wonderful. So the face maker again, and the butchering art, which is her first um her first book, uh, which is what I my first exposure to to Doctor Fitzharris. Work, yeah. So uh, check it out definitely. And let's now should we get to some. Stories? Listener stories. Yeah, Let's listener stories. Let's do it. So first story comes from Jackie. Jackie says, I'm a surgical nurse and have worked at several busy trauma centers. One memorable moment was when we were told to prepare for a couple with deep lacerations to their arms. Mm -hmm. By the time they got to us at the ER, they had we had more of the story. They were under the influence of some hallucinogenic type drug. And they had an actual sword fight. Oh, oh no. With real swords that they had used previously as decor. Oh, so, okay. Who won? Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> that, wow. Maybe if you're going to experiment with um, mind-altering substances, remove any... Move the weapons. Weaponry. Yes. Before... <laughs> no swords, guns, uh, uh, sharp, pointy pokers of yeah. kinds I, I don't even know what i'm talking about but just d d anything that could be used to physically harm somebody uh yeah take them away wow that's impressive that okay. would be hard to explain to your friends you know what happened oh well we had a sword fight <laughs> i feel like it's pretty easy to explain that whenever you got the <laughs> the lacerations all over your arms i just think you'd have some explaining to do <laughs> you would. about oh you would have some explaining how you to found do. yourself exactly. in that situation in the first nice. place wow okay so uh story number two comes from lynn I review hospital inpatient medical records and often come upon transcription bloopers. Always fun. Most of the time, it's fairly easy to understand what should have been transcribed. But last week, I read in an H&P, 85-year-old brought in by EMS with shortness of breath. His son is a physician and has been giving him death shots at home. Death shots? Death Okay, shots hold on, hold on, hold on. Home. I want to try to guess. What that should have been De has been giving him shortness of breath, uh, de death shot, depo shots, dep like steroid shots. Uh, the moral of the story, oh, maybe doctors make sure you proofread your transcribed notes before you sign them. <laughs> I love that she didn't tell us she what it was supposed to be. Maybe was. she didn't know. She thinks it should be obvious because you know, 
Well, well, you're in the medical profession, maybe. but what she doesn't De- understand <laughs> is, that... is how much of it you've forgotten. That's true. Uh, de- death <laughs> shot, de- depo. De- maybe someone could tell us de- in the comments shots. if you've yeah, figured if you out what that you know should what it be. Is. What are what are what what are death shot? What what should it have been instead of death mm. shots? See, we're We'd leaving them know. with yes, a medical please. mystery for this episode. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Send us your stories at knock knock high at human dash content dot com. Thanks for those, Jackie and Lynn. Thanks for listening. Uh, tell us what you thought of the episode. Did you like the little myth or Marvel a, a game we played? I feel like uh, I was surprised by how many things that I thought were medical myths actually like had some basis in reality. Yeah, like it's not so black and white. There's maybe a modern version. Right, or we're use still like for doing things, things that that you know. 100 years ago seemed crazy. And right. so, uh, I don't know. Well, in the way they did them 100 years ago is perhaps right. not, you know, very helpful. But the fact that there's still a use for them is really interesting. Yeah, I, I could just come up with like a list of 100 cr- things and just have her tell us like, oh, what's the origin of this? Yeah, I know. It seems like she, she knows knew everything. all of them. <laughs> that yeah, was, That was so awesome. <laughs> uh, there's lots of ways to hit us up. If you have thoughts or any ideas for future games or guests, uh, you can email us, knockknockhi at human-content.com. Visit us on our social media. We're on every social media platform out there. You can hang out with us and our Human Content Podcast family on Instagram and TikTok at Human Content Pods. Uh, shout out to the great listeners all of, out there. All of you are great. Leaving wonderful feedback and reviews. If you subscribe and comment on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube, we can give you a shout out. Like Seth H. on Patreon said, on your discussion with Dr. Bon Koo, was it Dr. Bon Koo is great. Yeah, he's yeah. great. Healthcare design. Healthcare design. On your discussion with Dr. Bon Koo, you mentioned the slit lamp looking like a medieval torture device. My background is in radiology, and we often refer to the device, uh, to the device called a pigostat <laughs> as a medieval torture device. The purpose of the device is to hold pediatric children completely still during chest radio- radiography. You'll have to check it out sometime. I have seen that actually. I think it's like it's this thing like it smashes the kid like right here so they can't move, and their hand, their arms are like way up high like this. It looks it sounds like way over horrible. Yeah, it it looks. I'm sure they love it. Well, it's it's not because you can't move right yeah. during a chest X-ray. So uh, I'll check out the pigastat. It's not called it's like a, a big pigostat. weighted blanket. It's... That's what I'm imagining. No, it's like, like really heavy. I, I don't know. I don't want to. I'm not sure exactly, but I yeah. in my mind I have this. This idea of like a kind of like a like straps strapped in with arms above the head. I don't know. It's a very awkward, weird looking position for a kid, for like yeah. a little kid. Uh, send us your stories, jokes, guest ideas, everything. We want to hear all of it. Uh, YouTube, uh, you can find our episodes every week on YouTube at my channel at the Glock and Flecken. Uh, we have a Patreon, lots of cool perks, bonus episodes where we react to TV shows, movies, hang out with other members of the Knock Knock High community. We are there interacting, commenting, uh, doing uh, live stream events, like all kinds of stuff. Uh, you get early ad free episode access. It's great. Come join us. Patreon. Deleted scenes. Yeah. Patreon.com slash Glock and Flecken or go to Glock and Speaking of Patreon community perks, new member shout out to um, Aike. Mark H, Dan, Amy A, Rachel L, and Seth H. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Also, as always, shout out to a uh, virtual head nod, I should say, to the Jonathans out there. Patrick, Lucia C, Sharon S, Omar, Edward K, Stephen G, Rosk Box, Jonathan F, Marion W, Mr. Granddaddy, Caitlin C, Brianna L, Dr. J, Chaver W, Jonathan A, Leah D, K L, and Rachel L. Patreon Roulette. All right, random shout out to somebody on the emergency, emergency medicine, medicine tier. tier of Patreon. So, shout out to Corin B for being a patron. Thanks, Corin. It's probably Corin. Cor- Corin. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm really. I'm not good. With, I, no. I do my best. Names aren't your. I do my best with seat. names. So if anybody, if I ever say your name on this, I just uh, just give cut me some slack here. I apologize. Uh, thank you all for listening. We're your hosts, Will and Kristen Flannery, also known as the Glockenfleckens. Special thanks to our guest, Dr. Lindsay Fitzharris. Our executive producers, Will Flannery, Kristen Flannery, Aaron Corney, Rob Goldman, and Shanti Brooke. Our editor and engineer is Jason Portiza. Our music is by Omer Vinsvi. To learn about our Knock Knock High's program disclaimer and ethics policy, submission, verification, and licensing terms, and HIPAA release terms, 
You can go to glockandflanken.com or reach out to us, not not high at human-content.com with any questions, concerns, or fun medical puns if you have to. Knock Knock High is a human content production. Thanks for watching the episode. You can find more on that playlist over there. If you prefer to listen or you just had your eyes dilated, you can binge full episodes wherever you get your podcasts or join the party over on Patreon where you get early access episodes, hang out with us, get lots of exclusive bonus content. Hope you subscribe, leave a comment below. Let us know what you think.